Welcome to the deep dive. Today we are uh, strapping in for a really high stakes look at a stock that's just been lighting up the markets. D-Wave Quantum Kicker QBTS. Yeah, it's been absolutely explosive. Right. I mean, the promise is huge solving problems that even today's supercomputers just can't handle. And the stock, it soared, what, over 2,000% in the last year alone? It's captured everyone's attention. It really has, but that's the core question, isn't it? Is this incredible run based on a genuine tech revolution that's finally, you know, hitting its stride? Or are we maybe watching a speculative bubble that's just waiting to pop? That's exactly what we're here to figure out. Our mission today, we're looking at QBTS, trading currently at $27.29 per share as of October 22nd, 2025. And, well, we have to be up front from the start. Yeah, the financials. They show a pretty extreme disconnect. It's kind of startling when you first see it. It is. We're talking about a company with a market cap, get this, $9.33 billion. Billion? With a B. But then you run the numbers, you look at the fundamentals, and our educational discounted cash flow model, the DCF, it comes out mathematically negative. Negative. You heard that right. We calculated an intrinsic value of minus $4.23 per share. That number just hangs there, doesn't it? It really does. So understanding how the market justifies that massive dab, how it's betting on potential that might be, frankly, decades away, that's really the heart of this deep dive. Okay, let's start with part one, business fundamentals and financial reality. And first up, hashtag tag tag chapter one, business understanding. Right. So what does D-Wave actually do? Because it's maybe not what you first think when you hear quantum computer. Exactly. They've got sort of a three-pronged approach to making money, haven't they? They do. The main one, providing the most uh, recurring revenue, is their quantum computing as a service, or QCS. That's delivered through their Leap Cloud platform. That makes sense. QCS is key because it lowers the barrier, right? You don't need to buy a huge, expensive machine yourself. Exactly. You just subscribe. But they do also sell the hardware directly. That's their second stream. These are big ticket items, though. So the revenue is kind of lumpy, unpredictable, like that big 10 million deal they just announced in Switzerland for an Advantage 2 system. OK, QCSS, hardware. What's the third part? Professional services. They call it D-Wave Launcher. Basically, helping companies get started, integrate the tech. It's consulting, really. Which probably builds sticky relationships, too, I imagine. Oh, definitely. Given how new this all is, that hands-on help is crucial. It's not just revenue. It's about embedding themselves with the customer. Okay, let's talk tech for a second. D-Wave uses something called quantum annealing. How is that different from, say, what Google or IBM are working on? That's a really critical point. D-Wave offers practical quantum computing usable today. Annealing is specialized. It's designed specifically for optimization problems. Optimization, like what? Logistics, finding the best route for delivery trucks. Exactly like that. Or financial risk modeling, complex scheduling, even training certain types of AI models, stuff where you need to find the best possible answer out of a huge number of possibilities. Mm -hmm. It's immediately useful for businesses now. Right, whereas the other guys, the big names, they're mostly focused on the universal gate model. Correct, and that gate model approach is theoretically much more powerful, more versatile, uh -huh. but well, the consensus is it's still years, maybe decades away from being commercially reliable or useful at scale. Uh -huh. D-Wave is selling a specific tool today. The others are selling a more powerful, but much further off promise. So D-Wave has this first mover advantage. They've been around since 1999, the world's first commercial supplier. They have that history, strong brand recognition. But then you hit what we're calling the scale paradox. Okay. Their total revenue trailing 12 months. It's only $22.28 million. Wait, just $22 million? Yeah. Compared to a $9.33 billion market cap, that, sure. that feels incredibly unbalanced. It is. It highlights just how nascent this whole market still is. The valuation isn't based on current revenue. It's based entirely on the belief in future explosive growth. And the market growth forecasts are huge, right? We're talking KGRs in the 30s or 40s percent range through 2032. Yeah, driven by finance, life sciences, drug discovery. Mm -hmm. The potential is definitely there. But the current reality is tiny revenues. So what stops a giant like Google with deep pockets from just crushing them if the market takes off? What's D-Wave's moat? It's actually pretty significant. First, the cost. Developing this tech is insanely expensive. Second, the technical difficulty keeping Quibit stable, the cryogenic cooling. It's 
incredibly hard. Okay. And maybe most importantly, there's a massive talent shortage. Yeah. Seriously, the sources say there are like three quantum computing job openings for every single qualified person. Yeah. You can't just hire your way into this field quickly. D-Wave has specialized expertise that's very hard to replicate. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about the people leading this charge. Hashtag, tag, tag, chapter two, management evaluation. Yeah. Looking at the leadership team, it seems like they're geared more towards commercial scaling now not just, you know, academic research. And the CEO, Alan Baratz, he has a relevant experience here. He does. His background is really defined by his time as the first president of JavaSoft at Sun Microsystems. He took Java, a platform, and scaled it into a dominant enterprise technology. Ah, okay. So there's a direct parallel to D-Wave's cloud strategy with Leap and their Ocean SDK. He's done this kind of platform scaling before. Exactly. It suggests a focus on building an ecosystem, not just selling boxes. Which brings us to how they're spending their money, their capital allocation. Right. They're all in on growth and R&D. We saw that big $400 million at the market ATM equity offering back in June 2025. Yeah, a huge race. Uh -huh. And they were very clear what that money is for, acquisitions. Their stated goal is to expand our already significant lead. So they're using shareholder money to fund a buy versus build strategy, like a venture capital firm almost? Pretty much. You they're bet. trying to snap up complementary tech or talent. But there's a big consequence to that ATM offering. Dilution. Massive dilution. The number of shares outstanding has tripled since the end of 2022. Existing shareholders are footing the bill for this M&A ambition. Mm -hmm. Is that a red flag or just the cost of trying to dominate a new market? It's definitely a risk. It could mean they feel they can't develop everything fast enough internally, mm. but it does show aggression. Now, if we look at a key financial metric of performance, return on investing capital, or ROIC, well, it's not pretty. You're not pretty. Deeply negative. Some reports put it as low as 300, 392.9%. Whoa, okay, break that down. What does minus 400% ROIC actually mean? It means, in purely financial terms right now, the company is essentially destroying value. For every dollar invested into the business, they're currently getting a significant loss back, not a return. Ouch. Yeah. Now, this is somewhat expected for R&D heavy companies betting on a huge future payoff. It's a painful reality of investing heavily today for exponential returns way down the road. But you have to acknowledge that current financial drain. Which leads us directly into the broader financial picture. Hashtag tag tag chapter three, financial analysis. Okay, so we keep coming back to this. Market cap, $9.33 billion today. Just staggering growth from, what, around $140 million the event of 2023. That's over 4,500% increase. Insane. Now, let's look at the margins. You mentioned a tale of two companies here. Exactly. On the one hand, their gross profit margin is incredibly strong, 82.5%. That tells you the core product, the IP, is valuable. It commands margins like a top-tier software company. Okay, that's the good news. What's the other side of the coin? The reality check. Operating margin is negative 353.1%. And the net profit margin, it's mind-boggling, mining at 1,263.9%. Minus 1,200%. How is that even possible? It means that while the thing they sell is profitable on its own, the costs of running a business, primarily the huge R&D spend and sales, general and administrative costs, just completely overwhelm the sales revenue. So they need absolutely massive exponential revenue growth just to get anywhere near breaking even. Precisely. And analysts don't see that happening until 2029, maybe even later. They're consistently losing money. And the losses have been widening, never been profitable. And they're burning through cash, free cash flow negative. Persistently. FCF was negative $45 million in 2024. They're burning cash constantly. So how are they still operating? Ah, the equity offering, liquidity. Exactly. Yeah. That $400 million raise gave them a huge cash cushion. Their balance sheet looks strong purely from a liquidity perspective because of that cash. Their current ratio is extraordinarily high, like $42.99. But remember, that cash, over $819 million of it now, came from selling stock, not from selling quantum computers profitably. It's like they have a giant safety net woven from shareholder dilution. That's a good way to put it. It buys them time, a long runway, but they are spending it down. Which brings us full circle to valuation. The P.E. ratio is negative obviously useless here. Right. So we have to look at that discounted cash flow model again. Just remind us, why does it come out at Monica $4.23 per share? Because the DCF model projects future cash flows and discounts them back to today's value. If a company is projected to keep losing money, generating negative free cash flow for years and years into the future, as D-Ways currently is, then the present value of all those future losses adds up to a negative number today. Mathematically, yes. 
Hmm. It starkly shows that the current stock price, $27.29, has absolutely zero connection to the company's current or near-term projected financial reality. It's purely a bet on a radically different future. Okay, that's a deep dive into the business and the financials. Quite a picture. If you're finding this analysis valuable and want more like it, please do. Like this video and subscribe to the StockAnalytics.ai YouTube channel. And remember, members can suggest stocks for us to cover in future deep dives. Just drop the ticker in the comments. We do pick them up. Now let's move into part two, market dynamics, ownership signals, and risks. So given that negative DCF, what does Wall Street actually think? It's kind of contradictory. Well, the consensus rating from analysts is overwhelmingly positive. Strong buy. That signals a real long-term belief in the quantum story and D-Wave's potential. Okay, strong buy. That sounds bullish. But, and this is a big but, their average 12-month price target is somewhere between $26.30 and $26.63. Wait a minute. The stock is currently trading above $27. So the analysts are saying strong buy, but their price target is actually lower than where the stock is right now. Exactly. It's a clear signal. They believe in the long-term vision, but they think the hype has pushed the stock price beyond what's justified even in the next year. The price has run ahead of itself, even in their bullish view. That skepticism seems reflected in the short interest too, right? It's pretty high. Very high. Between 16.8% and almost 19% of the available shares are sold short. That's way higher than the average for similar tech companies, around 7.4%. It shows a significant chink of the market is actively betting against the stock, expecting the price to fall. So you've got analysts saying buy, but it's overpriced, and a lot of traders betting it will tank. What about the technicals? Is the momentum still there? Surprisingly, yes. Despite the huge volatility in these underlying questions, the stock is still trading well above its key moving averages, the 50-day $23.66 and the 200-day $17.17. From a pure charting perspective, the trend is still technically bullish for now. Okay, let's look at who actually owns the stock. This seems crucial. This is where the story gets really fascinating, almost schizophrenic. You see strong institutional confidence. Meaning big funds, pension plans, endowments. Yeah. Institutional ownership is solid, around 52 55%, and it's been growing. Major players like Vanguard and BlackRock are among the top holders. That's usually a strong signal of long-term conviction from sophisticated investors. They're buying the store. Okay, that sounds positive. But, but you look at insider activity, the people who run the company, the executives, and it's a complete opposite. Mm. Overwhelming mm. selling. Really? How much selling? In just the last three months, insiders including the CEO and CFO, sold over 540,000 more shares than they bought. Net selling. Big time. Hold on. So the institutions, the vanguards and black rocks, are buying in, betting long term. But the actual executives, the people with the deepest inside knowledge of the tech progress and the sales pipeline, they are cashing out at these high prices. That's exactly the picture. It's a fundamental disagreement playing out in the market. How do you even interpret that? It feels like a massive red flag. It strongly suggests a difference in timelines. Insiders might be thinking, this valuation is fantastic now, but the payoff justifying it is still years away, so let's take some profit. Institutions might be thinking, this is a tiny part of our huge portfolio. It's like a venture capital bet on the future of computing. We need exposure, even if it takes a decade. And what about retail investors, individual traders like you and me? They hold a huge chunk, too, somewhere between 45% and 52% of the shares. That high retail involvement definitely contributes to the stock's wild swings, the volatility. They're often more driven by momentum and headlines. Okay, let's try and pull the risks together. So, summarizing the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. The key weakness is obvious. The deep financial unsustainability, the cash burn, and the constant shareholder dilution. Right, and the biggest threat. Technological obsolescence. This is the existential one. D-Wave is betting everything on quantum annealing being the best practical approach for optimization now and for the foreseeable future. But what if it isn't? What if Google or IBM or someone else has a major breakthrough with their universal gate model computers? That's the nightmare scenario for D-Wave. If gate model quantum computers suddenly become powerful and reliable enough for commercial use much sooner than expected, they could potentially solve a wider range of problems, mm -hmm. possibly even optimization problems, better than annealing. D-Wave's tech could suddenly become a niche product, or worse, largely irrelevant. That would just crater the stock, wouldn't it? Instantly. The entire bull thesis relies on annealing maintaining its practical advantage for a significant period. Okay, what about broader economic risks? Interest rates, for example. D-Wave is what they call a long-duration asset. 
its value is almost entirely based on profits expected far, far out in the future. Right. So when interest rates go up, the discount rate used to value those future profits also goes up. Higher discount rate means those distant future profits are worth less today. So rising rates disproportionately hurt stocks like D-Wave, whose payoff is way down the line. Makes sense. And geopolitical risks, supply chains. Definitely a factor. Building these machines relies on a complex global supply chain for highly specialized components. Things like potential U.S. tariffs, say 25% on semiconductors, could directly increase their costs and potentially delay their R&D timelines, which are already ambitious. Any disruption there is bad news. All right, let's bring it all together. So let's synthesize the bull versus the bear case. Oh, for it. The bull case. Bulls point to the pragmatic quantum solution, annealing, being available today, and getting commercial traction. They highlight the high barriers to entry protecting D-Wave, the first mover advantage, and the strong institutional backing from big names buying into the long-term vision. They're the pioneers making quantum practical right now. Okay. And the bear case. Bears hammer on the extreme valuation disconnect. $9.33 billion market cap on just $22 million in revenue. They point to the consistent massive losses, the heavy insider selling suggesting even management thinks the price is too high and the huge looming risk of technological obsolescence if gate model computing advances faster than expected. And our final valuation summary just reinforces that divide. Absolutely. The current share price of $27.29 is fundamentally opposed to our educational DCF intrinsic value calculation of negative $4.3. They're just worlds apart. So the final outlook, what kind of investment is this? Look, an investment in QBTS today is not a traditional value play. It's not even standard growth investing. It is pure and simple, a high-risk, high-reward, venture capital-style bet on a potentially revolutionary technological paradigm shift. If they succeed, the returns could be extraordinary. But if they fail or get leapfrogged by competitors, the potential for substantial, maybe even total capital loss is very real. That wraps up our deep dive on D-Wave Quantum, a truly fascinating and maybe terrifying story. Before we sign off, here's a final thought to chew on. We talked about the threat of future gate model computers breaking today's encryption. That's a huge security risk driving research. Right. But what if D-Wave's annealing technology, well, maybe not the lockpick for breaking old crypto, turns out to be the essential locksmith's tool for building the new crypto? The process of designing and validating new quantum-resistant algorithms is itself a massive optimization problem. Ah, finding the strongest possible new encryption methods. Exactly. And that's perfectly suited for D-Wave's annealing capabilities. It could open up a huge, urgent market, especially with governments, focused not on breaking codes, but on creating the unbreakable codes of the future. Something to consider. That is interesting. A potential opportunity hidden within the threat. Okay, if you want this level of deep analysis on other stocks, remember, for just $4.99 a month, you get access to our playlist of 500 deep dive videos covering all the S&P 500 stocks. And coming up next, exclusively for members, we're tackling the NASDAQ 100. And please always remember, this analysis was generated by an AI system. It's for educational purposes only and should absolutely not be taken as financial advice. Always do your own research, your own due diligence, or consult with a qualified financial advisor before making any investment decisions.